When I was a boy growing up in the late 1960s, I was fascinated by the Second World War. I particularly liked stories about the Royal Air Force, and I saw films about brave RAF flyers at the cinema and on TV. My brother and I were fascinated with war comics about Britain fighting against Germany, and we loved building model aircrafts. I think Spitfires were my favourite. Growing up, I remember that there never seemed to be any African or Caribbean people in the films and comics. There were never any black heroes. I thought this was strange because I knew that my father, John Henry Smythe, had been an officer in the RAF during the war. I recall asking my dad about his time in the RAF, but he would never talk about it when we were children. It was only when I was an adult and he was near the end of his life that he told me the real story. And it was then that I realized, wow, dad was a hero. Flight Lieutenant Johnny Smythe, my dad, was one of 6,000 young black men who volunteered to fight in the RAF. Nearly all of these men came from Britain's colonies in the Caribbean. And they were joined by 80 young black women who enlisted in the Women's Auxiliary Air Force or WAAF. These Caribbean volunteers were the descendants of enslaved African people and they made the conscious decision to risk their own lives fighting for Britain and for freedom. Some of them even paid their own passages to the mother country, travelling by ship through seas patrolled by enemy submarines. In Africa, the colonial authorities made it difficult for black people to join the RAF and only 60 volunteers were accepted my dad, who was from Sierra Leone in West Africa, was one of the 60. And in fact, he was one of only six that were chosen from Sierra Leone. Once they arrived in the UK, most of the black personnel served as ground staff and more than 450 of them were selected as air crew. Of these men, 150 were killed in combat or in flying accidents, a loss rate of one in three. 100 of the Black Flyers were commissioned as officers and the 103 were awarded medals for bravery or exceptional service. Unlike the American Armed Forces, the RAF was not racially segregated and people of different nationalities and different races served together in the same squadrons and crewed the same aircraft. Before the war, black people hadn't even been allowed to join the British Armed Forces. But in October 1939, that all changed. The government ended the colour bar because it needed recruits to fight against Nazi Germany. By 1945, there were more than a million men and women in the RAF alone. Adolf Hitler, the Nazi leader, believed the German people were the master race and that they should rule the world. To Hitler, all other races were inferior and he especially hated Jewish people and the Slav peoples of Russia, Czechoslovakia and Poland. He planned for them to be exterminated or enslaved and began building a huge army and air force to conquer Europe. Johnny's grandfather, my great-grandfather, was also John Henry Smythe, an African-American born of a freed black mother and an enslaved father. He graduated from Howard University Law School that was completely unheard of at that time in history. And he latterly worked as an emissary to the USA in Liberia. 
A love of freedom thus ran in Johnny's blood. And in 1941, my dad volunteered to join the RAF to fight against Hitler and everything he represented. John Henry Clavo Smythe. Where am I going in this life? Named after my grandfather, a liberator who traveled the world. A black American freedom fighter. Will I follow in his footsteps? From Sierra Leone to Scotland, from hot to cold. I go fed for me king. I go fed for me king. I go fed for me king. Johnny Smythe joined up age 26 and traveled by ship to the UK. He trained as a pilot, but his high scores in maths tests saw him being selected to become a navigator with Bomber Command in November 1941. In August 1943, Johnny commenced the last stage of his training at number 11 Operational Training Unit at RAF Westcott. It was here that my dad and six other airmen became crewmen. Ah, another one wrong. I can't work out these bloody equations. I'm sick of them. Well, you know what they say, right, Chris? No, what? If you can't take a joke, why join the force? Well, I'm not laughing. I thought I left this stuff back at school. I hate mathematics. What do you mean? Mathematics is beautiful, it's logical, and it's clean. It provides certainty. It's either right or it's wrong. Once you crack maths, Chris, you can do anything. Johnny, tell me something. When we crewed up, why did you pick me as your pilot? I guess... I guess you look like a steady type. Well, thanks very much. Why did you pick me? Because you seem lucky. Really? How did you th th think that? Just a feeling. Is that the only reason why you picked me? I feel like a rabbit or a fool if it's clover or something. No, no. I also thought that you knew where you were going. And that's a handy thing for an app. It's good to be lucky too, though. We're gonna need it. We certainly are. Johnny, Chris, and the rest of the crew were posted to number 623 Squadron at RAF Downham Market. They began flying short still in heavy bombers on night raids against targets in Germany. Hello, Navigator. Hello, Skipper. 20 seconds to go. OK, Navigator. Hello, Bomb Aimer. Hello, Skipper. Bomb doors open. Thank you, Bomb Aimer. Ready when you are. Steady, steady. Hold it. Steady. Bomb's gone, Skip. Good show, Harry. New course, please, Navigator. Hello, Skipper. Will you turn on to 081? Okay, Navigator. 081. Let's go home, lads, and keep your eyes peeled for the fighters. Flying long missions over enemy territory at night was difficult and dangerous. It was also really cold, and it made Johnny long for the warmth of Africa. Each time they flew, the crew of the Stirling worked closely as a team, relying on one another for their survival. Over the next three months, the seven young airmen managed to overcome bad weather, enemy fighters, and flak, and together, they completed 26 successful bombing operations. Dad's crewmates liked flying with him because he was a good navigator, but also they thought he seemed lucky. The RAF was diverse, efficient, and highly successful. It was also glamorous, and Dad looked good in his light blue officer's uniform, wearing his hat at a jaunty angle. Well, Teresa? Mm hmm Well, Teresa? Well, what, dear? Aren't you going to ask me about my date with Stanislav? Would you like me to? Yes. Very well. Vera, dear, how was your date with your new Polish pilot friend, Stanislav? Well, Teresa, since you ask, it was heavenly. Really? Yes. He's so dashing and so romantic. Go on. Oh, Teresa, 
Stanislav said my eyes are as beautiful as the stars he sees when he flies at night. Yes, Polish boys know how to talk as well as fight. And he always brings me lovely flowers and notices when I've done my hair or I'm wearing something new. Careful, dear. It sounds like you are falling for him. Who wouldn't? I wouldn't. I told you, never date Hercule in case... I know, in case something happens to him. You must live your own life, Vera. But I hate to see you broken-hearted. I know, and you're right. I would hate to lose him. He's the best dancer on the station. Find a nice boy who stays on the ground. I'm far too young to be a widow, so I'll never, ever, ever fall for a flyer. Hello, I was wondering if I'm in the right office to leave this. Dad said the war banded people together from all over the world. The RAF recruited men and women throughout the Empire and Commonwealth, and it welcomed 30,000 exiles from Poland, Czechoslovakia, and other nations overrun by the Nazis. Are you with 139 Jamaica Squadron, sir? I'm with 623, and I'm West African, not Jamaican. 139? Squadron is called that because the Jamaicans pay for its bombers. So many people from so many countries. And all wearing the same blue uniform. And all drinking the same tea. Though Polish people prefer to drink it with lemon rather than milk. On the night of the 18th of November 1943, flying officer Johnny Smythe's good luck finally ran out. He was on his 27th mission a raid on the German city of Meinheim. The Stirling was hit by anti-aircraft fire at 16,000 feet above the target, and he was wounded in the abdomen and groin. Notwithstanding the damage, the bomber continued to the target and dropped its bombs, but on its way back, it was hit by an enemy fighter. One of the engines was on fire, and Dad and his crew had to bail out. Dad parachuted to relative safety and hid in a barn, but soon men in uniform appeared and began shooting. He decided he had no choice but to surrender. And the Germans were astonished when this tall black RAF officer appeared from behind the straw. They just stood there staring at him and he reckoned their amazement probably stopped him being shot out of hand. He was eventually sent to Stalag Luft 1 a prisoner of war camp for officer allied airmen at Bath on the Baltic Sea. Although the German guards were amazed to see an African officer in the camp, he was treated exactly the same as the other white inmates. For the next 18 months, Johnny kept himself as busy as possible and he got involved in the escape committee, helping other prisoners to break out of the camp. He knew he couldn't escape himself and in an interview many years later, a journalist asked him, Mr. Smythe, did you try and escape? And with a twinkle in his eye, he said, well, yes, I did think about escaping, where I could mingle with all the other six-foot black men walking around Nazi Germany at the time. On 2nd of May 1945, Stalag Luft 1 was overrun by the advancing Soviet army, and the Allied prisoner of wars were liberated. Johnny was hugged by a Russian officer. And even though they had very little food themselves, this officer took out of his pocket a piece of dried fish and offered it to Johnny, which he took and he ate with grace. After my dad was liberated, he returned to the UK and then volunteered to fight against the Japanese in the Pacific. But in August 1945, the infamous atomic bombs were dropped on the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the war came to an immediate end. Dad stayed in the RAF and in December 1947, the greatest event of his life, as he says, happened to him. He met my mum, Violet. 
Violet was from Grenada, one of the smallest and most beautiful islands in the Caribbean. She was a student nurse at a hospital in London, and for Johnny, it rarely was love at first sight. The moment he set eyes on her, he said, I'm going to marry you. She burst out laughing and said, you're crazy. But only a few months later, they were married at St. Martin's in a field church. Although Johnny never complained, Violet could tell that her new husband, he was sometimes in pain, physically, but perhaps more importantly, mentally. Are you tired, darling? Yes, a little walking in these shoes. What was it like, Johnny? Sorry, what was what like? The flying, the getting shot down and wounded, the being a prisoner for so long. Oh, that. Piece of cake. It's just that sometimes you have such a sad, far away look. Do I? It must be me thinking about my mess, Bill. I must say, I must stop drinking all that whiskey. But what was it like? A walk in the park. I'm serious, Johnny. How bad was it? Look, darling, I survived. Think about all the other chaps who weren't so lucky. I have no complaints. But Johnny, you know you can tell me. I am a nurse. There's really nothing to tell. In 1948, Flight Lieutenant Johnny Smythe was posted to the Air Ministry as a liaison officer with the Colonial Office. He was responsible for the welfare of the African and Caribbean airmen. And in May 1948, he was senior officer on board a ship picking up servicemen on leave in Jamaica. The ship was called the Empire Windrush. To Johnny's surprise, a large number of civilians, several of them ARIA veterans, also boarded the ship to travel to the UK in search of work. Each person had paid the fare of 28 pounds and 10 shillings, worth about 600 pounds in today's money. As the man on the spot, he had to think quickly and he set about interviewing the passengers individually before advising them on the best course of action. Though he didn't know it at the time, my dad was helping to shape modern Britain. Good morning. Can I say your name, please? Sam King, leading air customer, sir. And you served during the war? Yes, sir. I came here in 44. Excellent. Would you consider re-enlisting? I'll be open to persuasion, sir. I see. What was your trade? Flight mechanic engineer. I worked in Spitfires. Oh, good show. Why do you want to come back to Britain? Well, sir, there's no work in Jamaica. Since the hurricane in 44, it destroyed the banana, coconut and coffee crops. I've been unemployed since. I got demobbed last year. My family are farmers in Portland. They had to sell three cows to raise a boat fare for me. I'll tell you straight, it's not going to be easy. The food is rationed and the housing is scarce. And they're not taking any black employees. But you'll find work, if that's what you want. I'll give it my best shot, sir. I believe you will. Look, I'm not going to press you, but the RF is crying out for men with your skills. If you come back, you'll get a really warm welcome. I'll think it over, sir. Thank you. I gave you a, a chance and I learned some new skills. And you might want to do this thing. Hopefully, I will see you very soon. Sam King decided to rejoin the Air Force and he would later write, the RAF taught me two things, the importance of discipline and the importance of honesty. Returning to civilian life in 1953, Sam helped to set up the partner scheme in South London by which black people pooled their money to buy their own houses. He became active in local politics and helped found the Notting Hill Carnival. And in 1983, he became the first black mayor of the London borough of Southwark. Another hero of the Empire Windrush story was Hubert Baron Baker, 
a young Jamaican with a passionate belief in racial justice. Baron Baker came to the UK in 1944 when he was only 19 and volunteered to serve as an RAF policeman. Corporal Baker was demobbed from the RAF in 1948 and then did voluntary welfare work for black ex-servicemen in West London. The colonial office told him about the Windrush and the young veteran helped them make arrangements for the Caribbean migrants on board. Without Baron Baker, the story of London's black community might have been very different. Yes, could you put me through to Major John Keith, please? That's John Keith, I'll spell it, K-E-I-T-H. Yes, he's working for the Colonial Office. My name is Baker, Baron Baker. Yes, he knows me. Could you tell him it's urgent, please? It's about the passengers on the Empire Windrush. That's Empire Windrush, it's a ship. And it's due to dock on the 22nd of June at the Tilbury port. Yes, and there'll be... Yeah, I'll, I'll hold, I'll hold, thank you. Hello, John? Yeah, I'm not so bad, how are you? Yes, uh, accommodation. Th there'll be a problem with accommodation, but I have an idea. So, yes, there's an underground air raid shelter at Clapham Common. I stayed there myself during the war. It's very deep and it's quite gloomy, but it's comfortable enough. Yes, now, the passengers on the Windrush that don't have anywhere to stay, they could sleep there, at least for the time being, you know. We could set up the... Yes, I realise it's short notice, but... It's an easy solution to the problem, Major Keith, if the Colonial Office acts quickly right now. Yes, John, I understand that. And I know you've always helped us, but we... No, 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 John, 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 I'm not having people paying all this money to travel halfway around the world to find for there's... To find there's nowhere for them to stay, John. What are they supposed to do? Sleep on the park? Mm-hmm. Mm. I need your guarantee, Major Keith. I need you to guarantee that the, that the Clapham shelter will be open and ready to receive them when they arrive. Could you give me a guarantee, Major Keith? I need your assurance, John. I'll let everyone know to stay on board the ship when I receive a telegram from you saying the shelter is open. Will you promise to send me that telegram, Major Keith? Mm hmm. Yes. Thank you, John. I know, I know. I... It is short notice, and I, I do appreciate it. Yes, I, I'll go to Tilbury Port tomorrow, and I'll let everyone know that preparations are being made for them. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, and they're going to need hot meals when they get there. It's 30 miles from Tilbury to Clapham. They're going to be tired and hungry. We, we should... Really? You'll sort the food out. Good show. Thank you, John. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, take care, take care. <laughs> Many of those on the Windrush were ex-servicemen, and there was an immediate understanding between us. There was a greater feeling of togetherness among that generation of us than I have seen in any group I have come across. The nearest labour exchange to Clapham was in Cold Harbour Lane in Brixton. A number of the newcomers went there to find work, helping to establish the multiracial community we know today. In April 2022, a blue plaque was unveiled to Hubert Baron Baker in Blenheim Crescent, Notting Hill, for helping the Windrush migrants in 1948 and for defending the black community in West London from racist attacks 10 years later. Now that the war had ended, Dad realised he needed to do something else and he wanted to study law. He was accepted into the Inns of Court in London, where he qualified as a barrister. He was awarded a military MBE, and with my mother, he returned back to Sierra Leone. He initially worked for the government, becoming the Attorney General 
for Sierra Leone. One evening, Dad attended a cocktail party at the British Embassy in Freetown, where he met the German ambassador. The two men got talking and Johnny learned that during the war, the ambassador had been a Lochwaffe night fighter pilot. He then told him he'd shot down an RAF bomber on the same night and in the same area that Johnny's plane was shot down. The two men hugged each other and celebrated the fact that the two enemies were now friends. Growing up, I remember Dad always had terrible nightmares and the painful wounds he received in 1943 were a constant reminder of the war. But he wouldn't talk about his experiences until I finally managed to persuade him to tell me about his RAF service, not long before he died in July 1996. When I learned what he had really been through and how he had coped without complaint, I realised what a hero he truly was. I also appreciated how strong and supportive my mum had been over the years. My love and my respect for both of my parents grew enormously. Nelson Mandela wrote something that I think could easily apply to my dad. I learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. The brave man is not he who does not feel afraid, but he who conquers that fear. Johnny Smythe fought for freedom and fought for fairness. He volunteered to defend Britain from tyranny in war, and he helped to rebuild it in peacetime. He also played a part in winning Sierra Leone's independence from British rule on 27th of April, 1961. I know his grandfather, John Henry Smythe, would have been very proud of him too. Nice mum, thanks dad.